Welcome to TTP, Turnbuckle Talk Podcast. You're listening to Keeman Cooper and John Dugan. This podcast is sponsored by Dirty Blondes. Dirty Blondes is a bar located in the heart of Blackpool, famous for their banging tunes, cocktails and 18-inch pizzas. The only place to get a pizza as big as your table across the Fowd Coast. If you're ever in Blackpool, check them out. They're on Facebook and on Instagram. That's Dirty Blondes. Blackpool. Let's talk wrestling. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to World of Sport. Welcome to TTP Turnbuckle Talk podcast. I'm joined by the Scottish stud, John Dugan. How are we doing? How are you doing? <laughs> uh, today we've got a special guest. We've got the world number one, Marty Jones. Hello. Hello. Do you hey, want to just quickly introduce yourself um, for people who may not know who you are? And there's one or two of them, I'll be fl- believe you me. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, if you're into wrestling, you should know me, but I'm mostly old school, world sport, seven times world champion, done many world tunnels, and wrestling's my life, but really. You know, I've been involved in it since I was six years of age. That's when I started, and I'm still involved in it in a big way now. Yeah, I mean, you are one of the kind of old school wrestlers that are, that are left essentially yeah they've all left me <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about world of sport um first um i i i knew it was big but i when i was doing my research i didn't know how big it was it ran for 33 years oh yeah that's oh. that's i mean that's incredible and don't forget that uh when it world of sport wrestling was our shop window because it was on TV every Saturday afternoon, and obviously it was also on Wednesday nights, sometimes Tuesday nights, and nine times out of ten it was live. Hmm. It's none of all this big production that you get now. There was just like two cameras, and it would film, say, six matches. And it was just like an ornery, let's say Blackpool for argument's sake, Blackpool Tower was always on a Sunday night. And then they'd put the cameras, it would go to Blackpool, and they would just film a normal wrestling night. There's none of this beforehand production, say this, do that, do the other. Mm. They just filmed it. And then they'd chop and change it. Normally they'd show, um, you'd have a match on first, and then there was only two cameras. There wasn't all these booms and zooms and hard cams and all that. Mm-hmm. This is what baffles me with today's wrestling, but it's a, it's a way forward. And then your first match would be on, and then famous Dickie Davis had probably come on at five to four, and everybody's has got the coupon ready. You remember the Little Woods coupon? <laughs> well, they're going to win a million pounds and all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they'd check the coupons after the wrestling, but wrestling had come on, and they'd do one match, and the famous Kent Walton would say, welcome, another afternoon of professional wrestling, and you'd have a match on, and then you'd have top of the bill, say your second match, and then another match. Then the second um, three matches on the card would be shown the following Saturday. But the good thing about them days, like now, if there's a bit of a feud going on, I was very fortunate to be in the business at an early age, and there's a lot of wrestlers 
came into the business, it's not like it wasn't like today where you can possibly just turn up at a gym or a wrestling school. There was that there was no wrestling schools. There was just the odd one or two. And you had to be recommended by your family member or come through the amateur ranks before you could even get a sniff in professional wrestling. It was a very much closed shop. Not like today, like I say. But going back to World of Sport, everybody used to watch it. And when I mean everybody, I'm talking 14 million viewers on a Saturday afternoon. And many times when the Wembley Cup final was on, FA Cup final, we had wrestling on before the Cup final. And we used to outdo them because everybody wanted to watch wrestling. And oh, I, but I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I put it down to it as a working class entertainment. You know, and there was none of this. People could go, the guys could go to the football and the women could get together and have a few beers and go and let off steam and with the umbrellas and the hats and whatever. <laughs> but it was a way of life then, you know. Yeah. And the good thing is, if I was, say, on with Finley or Rocco or somebody, and we'd had a good match. Just say the people of Oldham, for argument's sake, watched it. But when that match came to their little village hall or their town hall, they remember the match because they'd already seen it on the TV. And then they say, hey, let's go and watch that live. And there was no... The biggest, the, the biggest draw on a poster when I was wrestling, if I wrestled at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, say, in Oldham, my own town, it just say wrestling. But when they say Marty Jones on with Finley, like I say, or Big Daddy on with eight stacks, Johnny Saint, Steve Gray, every match, it was about five matches, every match was worthy of a top of the bill spot. And the good thing is, it was just a way of life in them days, you know what I mean? Mm. Because it was like three or five pounds to get in. It was, a fa it was a family value where you'd go six o'clock, seven o'clock and still be home at ten o'clock letting off a bit of steam, shouting and bawling and doing whatever they want. But everybody left happy, you know. Well, you've touched up on a few things. The fact that it had more views than the FA Cup final is just, I mean, that's just amazing, isn't it? Like, My imagine brother. that now. It's just a different, completely different time. And... I've seen so many stories and seen so many footage of women who jump in the ring and literally pelt the wrestlers with their handbags. <laughs> yeah, it was seen once and twice. But don't forget, these women weren't sat up in the gods. They were the first ones to get on the front row. <laughs> and the biggest, name on, the biggest name on a poster was World of Sport Wrestling coming to, say, Oldham or coming mm. to Blackpool. Oh, let's go. Let's get the tickets. We might be on telly. <laughs> and I, I can tell you some tales about some of these women <laughs> when they're on the front row. They were there every time she knew they were. A very, very quick tale was at a place called Adwick the Street, which is just near Doncaster. And big mucky Mal Kirk, who played rugby, and it was a, it was a, a monster. Mm. You know, cauliflower ears, big belly. And this particular time, he was getting the crowd going. And there was about a group of six women or whatever always been there. But it actually got fueled up a little bit because I think it was one of them's stag do or whatever. So he went to the wrestling. And you talk about the handbags. <laughs> big mucky mal, whatever he was at the time, 25 stone, landed outside the ring and he went back and sat on one of the girls' laps. And the next thing, all the five girls pushed him. He hit the apron, and he threatened to, like, chin one of them, just working. And there was a bunch of gypsy women, and one of them just reached into the handbag, and as he turned round, she grabbed a pair of scissors and cut his leotard, and his leotard oh. fell to the floor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can imagine if them... You know, you've heard of knitting needles and you've heard of this and that. Very rare occasions, but it's true it did happen, you know. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you knew you knew you'd done your job then. You got the crowd yeah. out, you know. Um, just speaking, um, you got into wrestling. So I'm kind of going back a bit, but you went to wrestling in a way, kind of way, because you had an injury as a child, which led you into wrestling. Yeah. So was you? You was on your bike, was you? I believe. Well, you know, kids are little toddlers, aren't they? They had a three wheel, three wheel trike bike, and I was only, um, I forget, I was just about learning to walk, and I was on this trike bike outside, and the rain had washed a bit of the channel away in the backyard, the alleyway, the ginnel, as you say, call it. And um, my front wheel went in the channel where the rain had washed away, and it took me into a wall. And if you know anything about building, the old-fashioned uh, buildings, there was a brick wall. And when you lay one brick on top of another, you have what they call a tyre wire. It's like a dicky bowl made out of metal that they put on top of the brick to keep them all in line. And my bike went into the wall and I got this piece of wire in my eye. Obviously, I can't remember. My dad was telling me all this, but they rushed me off to hospital. And not a lot of people do know this, that I'm actually blind in one eye. 90, 90% blind in one eye. And I only wear the glasses to pull my eye. He cut the sinews in my eye. So the eyeball went over to the other side. Oh, nice. And then I was getting bullied at school in a way that kids can be spiteful, as you well know. They were calling me Clarence or the Milky Bar Kid and all this lot. And then I wasn't violent at that, but I had a bit of a mean streak in me. And I just used to fight. You know, I didn't like anybody taking the mickey out of me. So Mm. then my dad, who was a very, very good friend of Billy Robinson's, because my mother had an hairdressing shop and Billy Robinson's mother had an hairdressing shop in the same village. And Billy Robinson, as you know, is a world-famous wrestler. And he had a gym in Failsworth where I went to school and where I was born. And my dad took me down to the gym to learn to control my temper, really. And when I was there, Billy Robinson never talked about professional wrestling. It was always Olympic-style amateur wrestling. So that's how my wrestling started. And then I started wrestling on the mats with Billy and a few other people. Johnny Saint used to go to this school. Eddie Riley, Ian McGregor. That's later on in the years. But when I was a kid, that's how I started. Then I went through the amateur ranks and then became quite successful at amateur wrestling. And then when I was 17, uh, they was picking the team for the Munich Olympics. Now, let me get it straight. Our, we had some good amateur wrestlers and we've had some good amateur wrestlers, but not in the same level as the Russians and the, the Turks and the Mongolians and people like that. It's their national sport. But it would have been nice to go to Munich for the Olympics. I went to all the training camps because we uh, they took the British champions, which I was one of them. And then because there was no sponsorship or funding, I think I think three went out of 15, and it was all London guys, you know. So I decided then the medals, I, went, I thought professional wrestling was a joke. I thought it was all scripted. I thought they don't get hurt, and they don't do it. And like I said, there were no wrestling gyms. And then a famous guy is still with us now, Colin Johnson, Bulldog Colin Johnson. He uh, and a few others... Um, there used to be a ring always in situ at uh, Bolton, right in the stadium. And the ring was always there on a Sunday morning and one or two of the guys used to go down there. So I started going down there. Still doing my amateurs and I went over to Billy Riley's place and Ernie Riley's place and places like that, you know. So um, all the rest is history because it started like that and I've, I've done wrestling with a lot of other jobs as well. But wrestling's always come first, you know. Hope- you can put it down to the accident why I started being bullied at school and then learning the ropes, if you know what I mean. Mm. How big was wrestling at that time when you were sort of that age? As was big this- as in 
Like, oh, obviously, you've got like massive, like we said. But when you were like first starting out, how well known was it? Was it on CV or was it just well, let me tell traveling you, around towns? This is hard to believe. Without, it was bigger then than it is now. I know you've got your WWE and NXTs, but that's on the TV. What people don't realise, when we was wrestling, I could wrestle 10 times a week, not a month, a week. Wow. Because you had wrestling every night of the week, up and down the country. And especially with the holiday camps as well, all your superstars, they came all to this country. Daniel Bryan's, all them people went to Butlin's camps. And many a time you did 10 shows in a week there. It was crazy. It was like Dale Martin promotions, joint promotions. It was made up of six promoters. And if you was lucky enough, you had the independent scene then with Brian Dixon, Oreg Williams, people like that. And there was always a show, and I'll never forget this. One time in a week, one week in in our country, there were fifty-two shows in one week. Wow! Wow! You had to take a ring down from somewhere to go to somewhere else. Didn't have enough rings, <laughs> but it was massive. But. I was also on that TV show and unfortunately Pat Roach got in the ring and said, ladies and gentlemen, we won't be coming into your living rooms anymore. This is it. And they, they rang the bell for the 10 bell count and it's never been on TV since on a Saturday afternoon. Then they've had a little go of it again now at World of Sport. That came back a little bit. Was, it was called, WOS. And then... It's never been replaced since. But obviously with the NXT brand, which I am I like, I've got one eye on The Rock now in, in uh, WrestleMania in 2016. You're talking 76,000 people. But that was only a one-off. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You're talking Royal Albert Halls, all the iconic Halls, Kelvin Hall, Glasgow. It was crazy. Well, I, 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 I rang my dad this morning and I said that I was interviewing you because he used to watch World of Sport and my granddad used to watch World of Sport. When I rang my dad, honestly, I've never he heard him sound so happy in all his life talking about World of Sport. It seems like it was just like a family affair where you sit down in front of the TV and like you said, millions, millions of people watched it. And I, I, can, I, can, I can't believe it now that wrestling was big then than it is now. Oh, yeah, in a different way, don't get me wrong. But don't forget, you're running just a normal budget, a promoter run a show, and then ITV would get in touch with them and say, look, we need somewhere to go. Let's go to Blackpool. Let's go here. Let's go there. Mm. And all they did was film the show. I know it sounds, I don't want to let any, too many cats out of the bag, but when you see a show, you know, they've been at it all day rehearsing or practicing or doing whatever yeah and, i mean nxt uk now it's like going back in time to the world of sport days it's like i i, I respect anybody that puts a pair of wrestling boots on male female whatever i respect them all because this isn't a joke this business like a lot of people treat it as a joke I treat it as a business because that's what it is. And the thing is, they've got the TV to look at, you know, to put them over. Mm. I mean, Ken Walton, who was a big, big name, Dickie Davis, people like that. If mm. Ken, Walton, Ken Walton said one thing on TV and it made me a star overnight. When I say a star, it made me a better household name in the wrestling world. I could walk down in Oldham and round here, I'm not so bad where I live. But if I was to walk, you know, in the middle of Manchester or down the prom at Blackpool, nobody would know who I was. 
I look like a gynecologist, me. I don't know. I can believe <laughs> like that. But when you got these guys, Big Daddy, Giant A stacks, our version of Andrew the Giants, they knew straight away. Oh, I've seen him on TV. We were big. And in the third world countries, in Nigeria and Africa, they're still getting our tapes now. And we're treated like football stars when we go there. And don't forget, at the same time, you had the European tournaments. Germany. You'd be there for 10 days in a tournament. And a wrestler. I was really in the business myself. I got a trip and I met up with, uh, in Germany, I met up with Mil, Mil, Mil Mascaras. who was a legend in Mexico. And he said, would you like to come to Mexico? I thought he was taking the piss, you know what I mean? I thought, <laughs> yeah, how am I going to get there? <laughs> anyway, the next thing is, I've only been in the business six months and I was in Mexico. Wow. Topping the, top the bill well, 33,000 people. I just want to show you this. I think you've seen this already. Um, yeah. This is a program. Now, I mean, let's just open it up. So this is you in Japan. Yeah, with Kido. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's a great read. I have quite a few of these. Um, but, I mean, that, I mean, to go to Japan and, like, it must have been, it must have been amazing. Well, don't forget, I always kick myself and say, why me going to Japan? And what happened, a lot of British guys had been over to Japan. I'm talking about the older days, not as in now. Mm. And the, the class wrestling is their national sport with the sumo and this, that and the other. But they didn't have a lot of, um, what's the word? Razzmatazz. It was more kicking and punching, straight wrestling, semi-shoot mm. wrestling, they call it. And because they had a good amateur background and they wrote to you, you didn't write to them. If you ask, there were a lot of flamboyant people that went to Japan in the earlier days. They were like wrestlers. Mm. Because that's mm. the way they liked it. That was their style, kicking and punching. And because I'd done well in the amateurs, and I had a good mentor in Billy Robinson, who was a massive big name in Japan. They thought, oh, this kid must be okay. And you get recommended by other wrestlers. And when I got there, I met Carl Gotch, who is a legend, you know, his training and this, that, and the other. And, and he was among the big names in the game. And I was very fortunate that a lot of people don't know this, that Andrew the Giant, when he was 18, he was 18 stone. And he came over to Wigan to learn how to wrestle. Now, Andrew the Giant was a rugby union player when he was in France, because he was French. And then he developed this giantism, and the rest is history. But he always regarded the English people who helped him wrestle. He wasn't familiar... When we went to Japan, you'd be fast asleep and the phone would ring at the side of your bed. Having a phone at the side of your bed was a luxury in them days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, Marty. You okay? Yeah, yeah. What time is it? It's one o'clock in the morning. Now, don't forget, you've just done an eight-hour road trip and wrestle. Be ready in five minutes. Why? Where are we going? We're going for a few beers. Because that man could go anywhere in Japan. The sponsors knew him. He never spent a penny. He was the eighth one in the world. And he had this little kid following him all around. Because he liked the British sense of humour. And I got to know him very, very well. And I became his tag partner. So I'm wrestling the guy that's going to go and box Muhammad Ali next week, and I'm wrestling him, Antonio Noki. It was me and Andre against Antonio Noki and Fujinami, who was a fantastic wrestler. Yeah, I was probably there to do the time in the match and this, that. I'm not bothered. But some of the stories I can tell you with Andre the Giant, we'll have to have another podcast, <laughs> because I'm telling you, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> mind-boggling. And where it's true, when they say he drinks 57 litres, 
It's not true. 75 litres in 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's it. God. It was good. Um, where was your favourite place to wrestle? Obviously, Japan, but obviously... To be fair, I like... Well, we, we talk about Blackpool. I like wrestling at the Tower because if you didn't wrestle at the Tower on a Sunday, it was great Yarmouth. Now, I would rather be at Blackpool <laughs> an hour away from my house than being great Yarmouth. <laughs> Four or five hours stuck behind a tractor. <laughs> but don't forget, Oldham, my own. I like wrestling at Hanley. I like, in our day, everywhere you went was adapted to wrestling. They knew who you was. And if you hadn't been on a bill before, they'd support you. It was a different atmosphere, if you know what I mean. It was... Um, mm. Like I say, it's a business. It was like, yeah, this show. I mean, you can talk Ricky Knight and all them down at, at Norwich. <laughs> I used to go down there and it was like in a cattle market. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Norwich. Um, can you tell me the, the story about when you had, you poked a gypsy in the eye? Do you know the story? I know it very well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want to <laughs> share it? It's, yeah, you might get me in trouble. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, at Norwich, you wrestled in, in the cattle market. And as you know, the Knights are big, big names. I know they're big names now, but there's big names down there in Norwich. And I used to wrestle there. And I used to wrestle. I was wasting my time. Didn't want to see wrestling. You know, they, they just wanted, as you know, there's a lot of gypsies and people whatever you want to call them but they're all great people down there and they see it as they are i mean northern lads call them down there pikeys and they don't like being called pikeys or gypsies and this that and the other but the, the good thing is when i went down there i saw who were the nasty guys who they didn't like mm -hmm. and there's me the clean cut type of guy and, and this particular time i went in and said I'm the best from the northwest. Well, that did it. They just needed somebody to shout at. What do you mean you're the best from the northwest? And then I used to come out to that music, Tina Turner, simply the best. <laughs> fucking get them straight at it. <laughs> and then I used to walk in, and one particular time, somebody pulled Jimmy Elshin off the uh, apron. I think that was a woman. So I ran in and help save him to be honest and we set a tag match up and then there was a big fat gypsy type of guy who had a load of kids around him now don't forget we're going back a few years now whether he was the the king of the town or whatever I don't know but the thing about Norwich you used to get changed in like a little box room I bet your wardrobe that room there that you're in bigger than what the changing rooms were there <laughs> And there's one door in and one door out. And these people didn't sit down. They all stood up. And he used to be packed all the time. And the thing is, at this particular time, as I come straight out of the door, he's there, a big fat guy, and he's poking me on the nose. He, if I move to the left, he moves. And if I move to the right, he moves. In other words, you will not going to let me get through to the ring. So I pushed him out of the way. Well, all his mates came from out of the woodwork, like 10 surrounding you. Well, if you've got, to, you've got to be in this business, I always ask myself, if you was in the business and somebody jumped up on the ring to get in, what would you do? That is the question, what are you going to do? Open the ropes and mm. let him in? No, you're the king no. of that castle. <laughs> he's, he's there trying to attack you. Mm. As soon as he puts them hands on the top rope, bang, knock him out. Because that's what the crowd expect. You're the right. wrestler. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So this particular time it went on weeks and weeks and weeks and it was getting the heat and the anger up all the time and then I grabbed the mic after beating I think one of their guys Ricky Knight or whatever and said right the guy that keeps interrupting me getting to this ring meaning this gypsy guy I said you've had your warning now it's simple as this leave me alone or get in the ring now and we'll sort it out <laughs> Simple as that. 
And all the crowd wanted him to get in, but he didn't. But the next time, right, I was going in the ring, he kept calling me one eye. So I've only got one eye because my eye goes in the corner, as we said at the start of the podcast. So the MC was near me, I got the mic, and as I come out of the changing rooms, he said, you, you may have in this and effing that. I said, move out of the way. Well, what are you going to do? Touching bellies. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And if you call my eyes again, which I was pretty touchy about, you know what I mean? See, when I wear my glasses, it pulls my eye over. When I put the glasses on, it goes around my eye goes in the corner. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. In fact, I'm going to do it now if you don't move away. And he said, what are you going to do? And the mic was there. So they asked the MC to hold the mic up, you know, so we could, everybody could hear what we were saying. And mm. as I say it now, I get shudders sometimes. I just <laughs> snapped him in a way. And I got my finger. And he put it in his eye. And I don't know where he touched the nerve. He just, I put it in that far. He just went boom and he fell on the floor. He just went bang, out. I touched the nerve or whatever. And everybody was just gobsmacked. And I just walked in the ring going, you know. And I thought, I hope he doesn't attack me now. But that always stood in the mind of people. You know what I mean? Mm. But then I got, did my match and I said, I'm not going to say I'm sorry to that guy. But the good thing is, I think he fancies his chances, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? You want to <laughs> see that match, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, you want to see that match. And the good thing is, I've got one eye now, and he's only got one eye, so we're equal. So let's. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it's always stood in, you know. Quite literally, an eye for an eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It must have been quite good for sort of Kayfabe that. Uh, how hard was it keeping up Kayfabe in them days? Well, Kayfabe. You didn't have to go through kayfabe because what happened? Just say you arrived, right? Mm. That's a kayfabe in Japan. They had two buses. You always had the Europeans. If the Japanese guys were seen talking to a European guy or the opposition, they got sacked. <laughs> That's how strong kayfabe was. Mm. And there's kayfabe at Norwich and places like that. Nowadays, you'll get the second... Well, they don't have gowns now. They just have a string vest and a baseball cap, don't they? You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but when you had a gown, if that second didn't knock on the door, the seconds weren't even allowed to come in the dressing rooms. Kayfabe was very, very strong, and that's how the lads wanted it. Even if you'd come in the business, you had to knock on the door and introduce yourself before you could sit in the changing room. They weren't allowed. Mm. Was well, it anyone that kind of sorry? was anyone that kind of um, didn't play by the rules, or you know, like kind of was seen to spoil kayfabe, or was everyone kind of quite strict? In my day, they were very, very strict. As I said at the start of the mm. podcast, you couldn't just come in the business. You'd have to be recommended, or you've had to have been. You know, it's like. I tell this tale a lot. I was fortunate to go to the dojos in Japan. And people think I'm making these stories up. Let them think what they want. But you would have a retired Japanese wrestler. And they'll look after me when they come out of the business. And they'd be in the dojo. And Carl Gotch and all the greats there. Fujinami, Fujiwara, Kido, Inoki. All them people were in the gym. And if you've seen any of them Japanese tapes where they train in the dojo. That's before they wrestle. And what they used to do, they used to get the old guy and they used to draw around the feet with a piece of chalk. So you'd be stood in the gym and you could stop, but you couldn't take your feet away from your chalk marks. <laughs> and if you wanted to be a wrestler, you had to do not 10 or 100, you had to do a thousand squats. As I say, you can stop <laughs> a thousand squats. And if you did 999 and collapsed, you had to come back the week after. Once you do a thousand squats, then they might consider you to join the gym. Wow. 
You know, things like that. <laughs> a lot of the British lads now do the deck of cards for training. But they split it up and do that's what's what that's where that came from, the Carl Gotch Bible, you know. Because yeah. it was treated. I mean, them wrestlers that you see in Japan, that's why I like Japan so much. And things have changed. Japan's having a transformation now where you're getting some companies are coming in wrestling blow up dolls and mm. shit like that. <laughs> to get in, you know, to get people through the door. But like I, our game took a bit of a dip when we came off TV because they didn't, as I said before, it was our shop window. All these people... Oh, I remember him. I remember her. Or well, I mean, like you say, female wrestling wasn't allowed on TV at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that slowly started coming in. But the female wrestlers, even on WWE, some of them girls, especially in this country, we were the flagship of them. They um, they were better than the guys. And some of the girls' matches, you know, when you see the Royal Rumbles and things like that, they pull them out of the shit because mm -hmm. until then. You know, it's, it's just the way the game's going at the moment. But when I was there, I can honestly say, never buy a wrestler's car. Let's put it that way. <laughs> because there was no, no sense in it. I'd be up at Edinburgh. Now, I don't want you to think I'm coming all across as big-headed. It's a fact. Because it's what I did. Some hmm. other wrestlers, I had to hold a job as well. So I, was, I worked at the meat market. I could start at five in the morning, finish at 12, then go to London and wrestle, drive there. And because I was like the apprentice at the time and giant A-stacks lived near me, I used to pick him up. I used to, I'm, I'm telling you, doing 500 miles with 45 stone lay on your shoulder, <laughs> that's training enough, you know what I mean? God. And it, it'd be asleep by the time you left the car park. But <laughs> you had to get back to do your job and unfortunately yeah. when people think I've had it easier I'm telling you now I haven't my wife died when she was 40 so I had to look after two kids at 9 and 6 as well as this so my family mm. and some very close friends it worked out but it was hard very very hard and my first wage was 6 quid but yeah. if I'd wrestled 5 times for a 17 year old getting 30 quid. It's like going to the pub and playing darts and getting 30 quid. It's a hobby. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you this now, no matter what you think about our game, I'm talking about when I came into it, Jack Robinson took me, that was Billy Robinson's cousin, to Connors Key, which is in Wales. And uh, one of the guys didn't turn up. You always have to take your gear with you. Lesson number one, whether you're good enough or not, take your gear with you. And I actually wrestled that night. And that's how it all started for me. And then it was more of an amateur wrestling match. And then the next night, or the next time, I should say, I was on with a guy that is, is regarded as one of the best ever at the time. And he was one of the first to go to America, a wrestler called Tony Charles. And I'll be honest with you, he had me disappearing up my own ass and coming out the other end, and I didn't even know I'd been there. He was like a <laughs> mat magician. He was fantastic. And then the next match, the third match, I just got smashed to pieces by a guy called Abe Ginsberg, who was a proper boom street fighter. And he knew I would come into the business. And after the match, he pulled me to one side and he just said, welcome, you've passed the test. And he took to me really well. Mm. But going back to the kayfabe, if there wasn't a knock on the door, you wouldn't open it. Even the guys, when they were coming into the dressing room, they'd knock on the door first. Mm. Just the rules that they had then and what it is now. And people, you know, it, it baffles me when you get, People like Cat Weasel and Big Daddy and people like that. How could you defend the job? I didn't want to defend it. Without Big Daddy selling um, Wembley out three times, we wouldn't have had a wage. 
Mm. And why I might be going on a bit, but it's the usual questions I get asked when doing the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I if, if I, run a, I run a gym now, we've had it tough with this uh, pandemic. I went to a new gym and new premises and got it up and running, and then all of a sudden the pandemic took on charge. So we've done nothing really as such for twelve months. But I have little trainee shows. Yeah. And because of my past name, I get a lot of European. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the future mm. in a big, big way. Mm. Because with all this that's going on in the world, I live on my own. And I read these. Without that, I'm, how can I put it? I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, me, in this social media line. I don't know how it works, to be honest with you. <laughs> but it's a way of communicating. Mm. And all this that you're hearing on the news about this, that, and the other, I've learned because I'm old, old school. You know, I don't want to get into it because somebody will start, why have you had him on your podcast and all that shit? Because that's what it's all about these days. Nobody has been there and done it. Everybody wants to dig an all and put you in and let's start again. But the thing is, the wrestling, right? There's a golden opportunity now for some people to make some seriously good money. I'm talking about the... I like the NXT UK brand, I'll be honest with you. Mm. But it's very much like the world sport style when I was used to be wrestling. I get mm. the flamboyancy and all the stars, Triple H and people like that. You know, they're telling stuff, But you've got storytellers. You've got people. It's like Coronation Street. Do this, do that, do the other. And yes, you do get hurt. And yes, you do get a few concentrations. Yes. Right? But when in our day, when I was on with Rocco and on with Finlay and people like that, nobody told me I wouldn't lose a draw. I knew what they wanted to do. But if I was on with Finlay and the match is going that well that we could get a return out of it, I'd lose. Because mm. that disappointed the mm. crowd, and then I'm, all we want to do is get another match going. There's so many different aspects and angles in this business. Mm. You know, podcasts, not being funny. I knew who Turnbuckle was. Funny enough, I've just been and bought a full set of Turnbuckles today <laughs> for the ring. You know? Yeah. But I've had a lot of good guys and girls pass through my gym, which I'm quite proud of. I see him on today. I mean, Sam Gradwell from Blackpool. He's one yeah, so, of my guys. He, he so we, we, had him, uh, we had him on yeah, the show. No. Um, and um, Sam Gradwell is just... He, he just personifies the British kind of style of wrestling. Yeah, he does. But Sam's... The best thing to Sam, he got injured. Mm. He reevaluated his. And I don't know his personal life. Because it's very hard when um, you've got a juggler, uh, and a son about or a daughter with this business. Especially in our day when you're travelling around. But he's adapted very, very well. There's one thing you can't take away from him. He looks the part now. I think his haircut's bloody balmy. I think it's stupid. <laughs> that means I've noticed, right? It means I've noticed. And a lot yeah. of people, they'll go... Sam Gradwell, who's him? Oh, do you know him with that Moican haircut? Oh, do you mean Seamus? Not him, the British one. Oh, that's Sam Gradwell, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm. His work is solid like he was in World of Sport days. A lot of them guys on there. Saxon Uxley's one of my guys. Ridge Holland, who's over in America. I'm proud to say, even William Regal, when he came from Blackpool, came to my gym. I don't want any thanks for it. I'm so happy that they learn and they've gone on. But all I've done is teach them the world of sports style that I was taught. Because it's like fashion, our business. At the moment, when it's a hot day when we get one, the miniskirts are out and the boob tops are out again. <laughs> That's what's big fashion. And wrestling yeah. like fashion as well. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I think... Wrestling is making a massive comeback, isn't it, John? Yeah, I think the British style of wrestling has definitely started to get more popular because it seems to be 
it's more like hard hitting and more realistic so, than what. What are you guys wrestling? Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. showman tip as much anymore. Yeah, I was saying to Kieran bef uh, before about like the British rules kind of um, matches mm. that you used to do. Like, I don't know why they don't still do them because they're so interesting to watch. They're not doing it right, in my opinion, though. Mm. You know what I mean? And you've got to... A lot of people, when they said they're going to do the British wrestling rules, went, oh, we don't want that shit. That's boring and all that. But the Heritage Cup, there was one last night, I watched it. Um, Mastiff was on. Mm. On with Tyler Bates. Mm. They did a, a rules match. But I chuckled to myself. They did the best three falls. And I think they did five or six rounds, three minute rounds. You tell any of the guys in the dressing rooms today. Just to go in and wrestle, I can have a wrestling match with you if you know how to fall or how to wrestle, or how to, to roll up. And we used to do 12 five minute rounds in a championship. You tell me what 12 fives is, is an hour. <laughs> you go for a walk for an hour, John, and let me know how you feel. Never mind, <laughs> probably about. Yeah, no. <laughs> Half of this lot now, when they go in and do eight or 10 minutes, Mm. They have a nosebleed. <laughs> but I do believe, and I'm entitled to my opinion, it's going mm. in the right direction. And the reason why it's going in the right direction, you've got Fit Finley who's been reinstated. You've got Johnny Moss, great guy. Robbie Brookside, Norman Smiley. You've got them all, right? James Mason. There's one common denominator. They're all British. Mm -hmm. William Regal at the helm, right? And I know William being a personal friend. I know Triple H was trained by William Regal, in a way. So the product that they've got is good. They're trying to go back to the world of sport, which I forecasted three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the referees for me at the moment, it's not their fault. I just think the referees, when they're going to say a 10 count out, it's like 20 seconds before they get to number, number three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I watched the match last night, and I'm entitled to my opinion. It was a great, mm. great match. Then there was just one incident in, in it. If somebody lies down, and you break the hold, and then you jump on the fella, break the hold, jump on the fella. I'll, I'll predict one thing now, and I've not spoke to anybody about this, but I do it on my trainee shows. The British public especially want to see the old-fashioned Johnny Saint Steve Gray match put on at the right time, technical wrestling. You want to see big bumps. You want to see it being... Realistic, which it is, mm -hmm. but it also wants to see the referees being more, in my opinion, the referees do a great job, male, female. I'm just trying to add my perspective on it because I've been there and I know what they're after. I mean, when we was on television, you couldn't pull the corner, pull the corner pads down, weren't allowed. And if by accident your nose started bleeding or something like that, if there was any blood, you knew they'd cut it. That's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Right? But I think the public warning rules should come in. Where the referee is in charge. Sometimes the referee goes into the match and they don't even introduce the name. He's just there with a black and white shirt on so they know he's the referee. Mm -hmm. But if somebody lays a hand on the referee... If somebody goes kick, 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 kick on the floor and not giving time to sell what he's done, look, I'm making sense, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Right, if you push that referee, you should get a public warning. And I do yeah. it on my trainee shows. If you get two public warnings, you're the bad guy now, aren't you? Yeah. 
And, and then all of a sudden, Big Bad John gets his second and final public warning. You get one more and you're out. And all the crowd start going, out, out, <laughs> out. So you go crazy in the crowd. And then the baby face comes back. Mm. I just feel they're going in the right direction. I just feel the referee. And that might be another good thing where they bring the managers in or the trainers as the seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean? For me, at the moment, it's just a bit too much. But listen, I'm old school. They know what they're doing. They're not paying my wages in a way. But I just feel there's been one or two matches lately where other people get involved in the match. They come mm -hmm. down the ramp and get involved. Yeah. And they lost all the personic and all the, the fantastic work them guys have gone. Uh, they've, they've been and done. Mm. Because you want to do it. You know what I mean? But there again, I'm going back to what I was shown and what I was taught and what we did. Yeah. You know yeah, I, mean? I, I, I I agree with you. I think we've done it where we've watched matches and then it's kind of spoiled by running. And it's like, what was the yeah. point in watching the two guys wrestle? I might be out of order by saying this. If you want exclusive scoop, this is probably it. So if Rui <laughs> or whatever watches it or listens to it, this, where you've been wrestling in a studio with no crowd. Hmm. That has shown me, because of the body language and the, the people that are doing it, there's a, no, a lot of Americans that can't do the British style. You know that, don't you? Mm. They used to, Gene, why on earth? No names mentioned, because that wouldn't be fair, and they've probably been told to do it. Why would you come down a ramp, clapping your hands and going, come on, come on, yeah, we've got them, yeah, I want to hear you. There's no crowd there. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Because wrestling is all about, <laughs> about make believe. Mm. I mean, Japanese guys, going back to them, they had no definition, flat chest or whatever, in mm. our day. But the legs, when they were, came out, the legs were massive. Because they did thousands of squats. Yeah. And they looked apart. Mm. That helps. Condition's a big thing in our job. The storytelling in our day wasn't as complicated as it is now. It was that guy who would get beat up and he'd win again and win again and win again. Then somebody would challenge him. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Just say I went to WWE now and went on with <clears> Brock Lesnar and you don't know me. And I beat Brosley, beat him. Didn't know who I was then, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. But I just feel some matches at the moment, when you're trying to get a G across, I mean, I watched Sam against, I call him Stroganoff, me. So I can't pronounce him that, Stroganoff, where he's got <laughs> Right? Yeah. I said to Sam, oh, I saw you. Can we do comment and help each other out? And Sam's come down doing the verbal thing. And he's kept that up. Mm. Might be his new role. But one, he looks the part. Two, he can wrestle. Three, it's hard hitting. And the fourth is, go back a few months, Sam Gradwell against Strogoroff, I call him, like I said. Right? There'd be no contest. Strogoroff would win. But mm. because Sam's come back bigger and stronger... See what I'm saying? Yeah, People no, I agree. Win. Oh, he might win. And the thing is about one of the best wrestlers for me, technical, and you probably won't agree with me, and he's a lovely, lovely guy, is Cesario. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I absolutely love Cesario. I am his biggest fan. I feel like he needs the biggest push because he's well, just so stopped. good. You've answered me, you've answered me question. Sorry, I might get bollocking for this podcast, but who gives a shit? Right? Yeah, who gets <laughs> Right? I'm entitled to my opinion. Yeah. That's why yeah. sometimes I like these podcasts 
when the audience can come and give me ask me some questions. Mm. Because you get me shocked a little bit if I tell the truth, right? Might get me in trouble, but don't matter. A lot of it today. Why do you not think Cesario isn't a world champion? Because he was going to give him the push. Mm. Do you know what? Honestly, I don't know. John well, I want to answer seems you. to think. John seems to think. I want to tell you why. Go on. And I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but I'm not that okay. daft. One, where's Cesario from? So that's what John said, yeah. Where's he from? <laughs> so he's uh, from Sw Switzerland. Right. They're into cycling and yodeling. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And they can't get the TV deal for him. Yeah, now then, a good point. Then. Back a couple of months ago, I had the pleasure of going and meeting Matt Bloom and Regal and all the guys at the Performance Centre in America. I had a day there. They invited me down. Mm. Fantastic experience. I wasn't a guest trainer or anything. I was just over in America doing some seminars. And they, they knew I was there, so I went. And there was this Indian guy. And I just kept looking up. Like that. Oh, my God, the sides of him. <laughs> and the same guy was actually a base, I think a baseball player. He, he, he threw a ball, baseball, faster than anybody else and won the money type thing, you know. And I met him. And the, and the big guy now that's with... Um, God, Styles. This little island that we've got, a lot of people are very, very envious of British wrestling. They all try and do it. I'm not... There's things that I don't like about it, but I get it. Because, you know... It's the politics of it, and then it's like you said, it's what's going to make them more money. Because they had an Indian champion a couple of years ago, and no one could understand it, but the reason it was is because... They had a tour coming up in India and it was selling out and it was big TV deals. But, mm. but big Pat Roach, bomber Pat Roach, he went out to India and places like that and they sold it out all them years ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, this, it, because of this TV, it's gone global. It's simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I was amazed yesterday the tickets have gone on sale for WrestleMania. Where can you sell an event out that you don't even know who's top of the bill or who's this, that and the other yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's not as if I like Tina Turner. I want to see her at Manchester next week. I'm guessing she might be there. <laughs> what, do, you know, do you know how much the VIP ticket is for WrestleMania? Yeah, they're expensive. We've, we've looked at it, haven't we, the tickets? <laughs> yeah. Now, what that holds, I don't know. Right? When I say holds, I'm not about capacity. I'm talking about if I bought a VIP ticket, does that make me let me go to all the shows in a week? You see what uh, you yeah, so, so you, you go you go see NXT, you see Raw, you see SmackDown, you go to the Access the day before, right. the Hall of Fame, you get everything. Right. Two and a half grand. Yeah. Yeah. How, much is, how much is just a normal cheap seat? A cheap seat? It'd be a few hundreds. Yeah. So Imagine, honestly, my missus would rip my head off <laughs> if I spent two grand on the wrestling ticket. It's getting there as well and staying somewhere. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah, and all the good thing is all the little small shows in America, sales three went over and we can't afford to go here, there, there'll be a wrestling gym somewhere that night, and we're having a little show. So mm. they're doing something right. Mm. But, big question is, it happened in this country, if they lost all the TV deals now, you think they'd get, what is it, 76,000 at WrestleMania, if they didn't know what the build-up was or whatever? <sighs> No, I mean, well, TV is everything, isn't it? You think about the amount of people that subscribe to the yeah. network. It's got to be our shot window, and that's what the first question was mm. in this podcast. You know, but there's one thing 
about the British guys is not many bad matches ever went on TV. And I'm, I'm, mm. I want to say, even at a town show, yeah, you know, you might have a, you know, we used to have Cat Weasel, whose real name, he was nearly, he was like nearly seven foot tall in. But his proper name was Gary Cooper, like the film star. Mm. And he went to a fancy dress once and dressed up as Cat Weasel and took a frog with him. Best thing he'd ever done. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the wrestlers that you've wrestled. I want to talk about um, Les Kettle. Les Kelly? Apparently, yeah. So apparently he is as tough as they come. Is, is that true, the nature of his? Les Kelly, right? See, like I say, I'm telling you stuff that I knew or what I saw. Yeah. I remember Les Kelly as a dry stone waller in the old days where you got the farms and you and you used to build the walls in the fields. His fingers were that wide, you know what I mean? <laughs> but he liked to drink his Les. And he never got a taxi to get home. He used to tell the landlord and phone the police. And he used to phone the police and say, Leslie's kicking off again. So he used to come, thinking he's fighting, because he's a famous wrestler, put him in the car and check him off. <laughs> <laughs> but Les was one of them. I was going, I picked him up once in Leeds, and in Leeds there's a lot of tunnels, and my diaphragm on my car packed in, and we stopped right underneath the tunnel and was going to Whitby, which was a long way away. And we just set off because he lived in Bradford. Broke down. Well, Les gets out in the middle of the tunnel. I said, Les, don't get out. And he starts coughing and spluttering because of the fumes in the tunnel. He stuck his thumb out like that. And somebody recognised him, picked him up and took him all the way back home. <laughs> I'd still be there like that. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but he was hard. He was a tough old farmer, was Les. And let me mm. tell you something. A lot of the guys in the world of sport days, could handle themselves. Mm. Because, as I said before, they came in the right way. They had the schooling right. They defended the business. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Is that true with the yeah. likes of um, Kendo Nakasaka? Less said the better. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Yeah. that's... laughs> well, serious. And I'll tell you why. As a gimmick, as a wrestler, a straight wrestler, as his character he played, 200%. He always had that mask on. Mm. But he's got a few weird ways that I don't particularly like. And I had a big court case with him, right? Not me personally, something that happened while we was on TV and he was going to sue him. And I got him off it, basically. And I never even got a thank you, kiss me ass or nothing. But he's a colleague, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, what was it like, because you've wrestled both Bret Hart and Owen Hart, what was it like wrestling them? Oh, it was terrific. I mean, I had good days, uh, and I thank Stuart and all the family when I went over to Calgary for the Stampede. Um, obviously, I was there with Dynamite Kid was there, and I was there before I was Dynamite's tag partner before Davy Boy Smith. It just happened, but um, I had great times over there. I used to like wrestling them all. If I had my way, I think it's because Brett had got the limelight with being WWE or WWF at the time, and Owen didn't. And I think there was something politics-wise between the father, Stuart, and Vince McMahon because they shoved a good-looking lad who could work Owen Hart into a mask. Yeah. And I'd never think that. And some will tell me, but I personally, I've got to thank all the Hart family and even all of them. You know, there's, there's Bruce, there's Ross, there's all them. Even, even Diana now, um, Diana's mother, you know, all the hearts looked after me and I enjoyed it. And it was like a stepping stone for me. 
But when I had my match with Owen Hart at Bradford, that was on World of Sport, Kent Walton said something that really made me. Because if Kent Walton, the voice of British wrestling, said, right, Marty Jones takes his leg off now and he hits his opponent over the head with it and puts it back on again, the British people wouldn't believe him. <laughs> the, he was the voice of wrestling. But I'd been on with Owen Hart a few times in, in Calgary at a Stampede Wrestling and did thousands of miles and it was a great experience. And then Owen was coming to this country and his first match was with me at Bradford St George's Hall on a TV <laughs> match. And if he was on second, that was the main event that week. Mm -hmm. If he was on fifth, he was, that was the main event of the second week. Next thing is the weather's bad. And Owen hasn't arrived by six o'clock at night to go on seven o'clock, up past seven. Gets a phone call. He's flying into Manchester on a later flight. Blah, blah, blah. So they send a car for him. Cut the story short. I'm not on main event now, second. I'm on fifth. And he walks in as the intermission has just finished. So basically, he's walked in on the fourth match. And he had enough sense to put his wrestling gear on, which we've done many times, in the taxi. <laughs> his music played. And I swear to you, right, on my daughter's life, we just went straight in the ring and wrestled. And the, the time before that was two and a half, three years ago, I'd wrestled in, in Canada. Mm. And we had a hell of a match. It's on YouTube if you get a chance to watch it. And Ken, watched Walton, that. Ken Walton said, and he could have said it to anybody at any time, this is one of the best matches I've commentated on. And with him, with him just saying that, the British public believed him. And I must say myself, it was a good match. But that that put me up a level in this country from being possibly might be somebody to being somebody. Mm. And it is a great match. Me and John watched it and yeah, yeah it is just it's, it's just perfection, isn't it? And all that that we just went in and did it. Yeah. As a yeah, better dimension amazing. to it, you know. Yeah. You see, a lot of people say wrestling's fixed, it's all bent, it's all this and that. I'll tell you something now, John. I live on my own. This is truthful now. And I sit here, in this little place here, and I, I cry sometimes, which is not unusual because of the, the world we're living in at the moment. Mm. I mean, if somebody wins uh, The Voice or something like that, I, I'm striking me. I'm thinking, what's this? Is this what they call depression? No, what it is, I started at six, right? I'm now 67. For 61 years, I've been in the wrestling business. I've had three full knee replacements on my left leg. Not one, three. I've now got an ankle fusion with 14 screws in my ankle. I can't do what I wanted to do. I can't go for a walk now. I'm still under the surgeon. Then somebody will turn around to me and say, wrestling's bent, you know. They don't get hurt. But when you've been there and done it, it hurts you a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. People yeah. seem to only knock them people that have been on the top. They don't knock them people. Whatever life it is, is on the bottom. And what it is with this pandemic thing, nobody is like at the halls uh, putting themselves over what they used to their life used to be like and people knock you and, and do this that and the other but when you've been there and done it yourself and you've still got an interest in the job leave me alone leave these people alone that are trying if you don't want to wrestle for them don't wrestle for them mm. but I watched that thing the other day alright it might some fantastic talent going off the subject, that AEW wrestling. Yeah. What's all that bollocks about? <laughs> Fucking barbed wire matches. 
it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. What, it's something. Listen, if the daft thing is, there's no crowd there, so don't tell me you're making money. Mm. Leave it until all the crowds come back again. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing with British wrestling, the way it's going, as I said at the start of the podcast, this is like a, a, che- a poor man's entertainment. Where else can you take mum and dad and two kids? I'm not talking about WWF, I'm talking down the road in Blackpool for 20, 30 mm. quid and have a night out. I actually love going to a live show because it's mm. just, the crowd is so pumped. You get all these chants and it's just, you get to kind of be part of the show, which, you know, is, it doesn't normally happen. Did you go to NXT at Blackpool? Um, I, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> I saw yeah, a bartender. Okay. I know, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm a bartender, so weekends is very difficult for me. Yeah. Um, but a lot of a lot of the kind of um, audience came into our bar and um, I, the whole month leading up to NXT UK, Blackpool was electric, weren't it? Yeah, but everybody... It was a mini version of like WrestleMania. Yeah. yeah. People were looking forward to that. Maybe a ticket was 50 quid. I don't know. I was lucky enough to be. Regal wanted me to go. And I went. I met Peter Thompson. Do you know Peter from Blackpool? He used to wrestle yeah. Steve Fury. He's a very good friend of Regal's. Yeah. So I met Johnny Saints, who's like my brother, my best mate. Always has been, always will be. And we went to the show, but we went to the Regal um, one-man show first. Yeah. Next door, stayed over, and then we did the show. And I asked, me and Johnny looked at each other like that. And it, we wrestled ourselves at the Winter Gardens. Right? Mm. And the thing that gets me about the Winter Gardens, you always look up at that ceiling. Yeah. And me and Johnny saying have a standing joke. And I said, Johnny, have you ever looked at that, ce- that ceiling before? And he said, yeah, when you knocked me out. You know, things <laughs> like that. But it's an iconic ceiling. Mm. You know, it's all gold leaf and this, that, and the other. The venue itself, you get a buzz when you walk in. So you pumped up. But it's what I was saying. It's our entertainment at an affordable price. I know when Wrestle, um, let's say Raw Smackdown's on now at, in Manchester, Mm. 12 months in advance it sold out but the tickets are 100 quid yeah yeah it was quite expensive because we went to Raw and Smackdown uh, a couple of times and they are quite expensive um, yeah but nobody's holding a gun to your head to go because you can watch no. it on telly if you want <laughs> but it's been there and this is what yeah. I think is going to happen once wrestling starts again for live shows it's a golden opportunity for our promoters to promote mm. and for wrestlers to deliver. Don't just, ha they're all back again. Balls it up. I mean, there's, there's so many promotions that come to Blackpool. We have uh, PCW, we have Mega Slam. You know, there's so many that, that come to our town. How long did it last? <laughs> a little bit yeah. <laughs> I mean good luck to him I remember PCW whether he likes it or not I know what he thinks about me because I've been told I don't think he's shy. I don't think he's ever had a pair of boots on but he's clever he'll put a wrestling show on the same night as NXT or Wrestlemania's on yeah yeah. alright and some of the guys and girls you use come to my gym I'm getting a good stable together, you know? And people think I can get people in NXT. They get themselves in NXT. All I could do is recommend people, Mm. right, that I think would be good for not NXT or me or whatever, good for the business. We all look after each other. And I, I I like it when I turn around and say, yeah, he's been to my gym. Yes, yeah, she's been to my gym. Yeah, I can see something in that girl or that guy. But there's no egos at our gym. If they have, they've gone. 
Mm. Let's talk uh, briefly about William Regal because he's from Blackpool. Um, yeah. You know, he's done, he's done so well for himself. And you you help got him onto the stage. How was training him? And you know, how did that all come about? It all came about that there was a great promoter called um, Bob, Bobby Barron who used to run the uh, Pleasure Beach. Mm. Where the crowd would be there, and then they'd get some people to challenge one or two wrestlers. And then Darren William Regal was there, and this down in there came across him a few times. And I saw potential in him, but I thought he was being wasted a little bit. And then he was a good looking young lad. And the thing is, Big Daddy always had a, a good looking young lad at the side of him. And Max Crab, through the promoter, started him using him as Big Daddy's tag partner. And to be fair, um, I got him away from that or advised him, but he didn't have a car or anything like that and he used to make the trip over from Blackpool to my family's farm. We had a ring in a barn with chickens and all the, ball, all the bales of hay and things like that. <laughs> and what Max Crabtree, the promoter from, you know, a British promoter, if he ever saw somebody eating pie and chips like a wagon driver, like 25 stone, he used to give him a card and tell him to come to our gym. And if they were any good, or even if they were no good. It was fodder for Big Daddy, you know. We'd, we'd throw them all over the place and then <laughs> Big Daddy didn't have them on a show. But going back to Eagle, he always wanted to be Another Tommy Cooper. He wants to be a comedian. He wants to be on stage as a comedian. Mm. And whatever he's done, I'm proud to say he's done it all on his own. He wrestled, he trained, he learned, he saw something different, and he was hell-bent on going to America before anybody. Mm -hmm. He had it in his eye, he saw a vision. Me and him went to South Africa together. And there's a great wrestler, very underestimated, a guy called Terry Rudge. He was a fantastic wrestler. Conditioned, great, bald head, European wrestler. And we all went to South Africa and we had a ball. We had, a, honestly, a ball. It was great. Especially when three of us got stuck in a lift with the, with the lady that uh, had no shoes on because she was a cleaner. <laughs> and we had the headband on and a mop bucket full of bleach so we got a, bu a bucket full of bleach and a mop this cleaner Terry Rudge me and Regal and the lift went down and it stopped six inches before it should have done because of the weight <laughs> and Regal went in that it said only two people allowed <laughs> we've got a mop bucket that weighed a lot <laughs> us three and we was in there for over an hour like that <laughs> woman god bless her <laughs> and the stench of the bleach from the mop bucket all our <laughs> eyes were watering and we were just ready for passing out when they opened the door or got the engineers to open it but we had some great time going back to your question he had the basics already. The charisma and the showmanship, I don't show anybody any of that. That'll come natural. Even at my gym now, I've got some great, great, honestly, up-and-coming people. But they invest in themselves. They're coming from Leicester. They're coming from uh, over the Blackpool area. They're coming from over in Yorkshire and things like that to come to the gym. And I can't wait for the gyms to open because I know for a fact that there's going to be quite a lot of talent. And hopefully, in a sad way, there's, got, there's not going to be a lot of money about at the moment, is there? Mm. Mm. There's not. So the wrestling shows, if they're advertised right, and because they're doing a good product on telly, I think British wrestling will come good again. I really yeah, do. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm saying that, I just hope it's not the promoters get their heads together, not together, but they run the show professionally. 
I tell you, just opening the doors, get everybody in, do something, and away they go. Because I, I do believe there's a reward now. If you two, if you two came out of my gym and you can see potential, it's not it's changed now. The performance center, for argument's sake, right? Not in this mm. troubled times. I'm talking about at one time. It's a good wrestler. Do you not interested in having good wrestlers now? Do you want really new wrestlers that are coachable so they can coach them? All the British coaches can coach them. I'll show them the basics, rolling ups and taking bumps. I try and show them some basic moves that are different from today's stuff. I don't show anybody how to do somersaults or anything like that. That just comes with confidence. The last time I showed somebody something and she got it right eventually, and she's going to be a great talent as well. She came to my gym and I learned her how to do the, the moonsault going backwards because she always wanted to do it. And that was Valkyrie. You know, the Irish girl. Yes. Now, she trains very hard over in Ireland before she came to me. It was just like her and her boyfriend came over. Well, she always fancied doing one. And we got her to do it. And she adds it into her repertoire and that now. Mm. You know what I mean? But if we could just get see, I don't know if British television came back again. You could build somebody up. I don't mind NXT if they give everybody a bit of a chance. Yeah. You understand what I mean? I think there's a lot of choice out there. That's the thing as well, isn't it? Because you think when World of Sport was big, there was only like three channels. Do you think that's the case as well? Yeah. But like the difference in money. I mean, when I was on World of Sport, you got £40. God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Big difference, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, I love the business to bits and I'll do it my way whether it's right or wrong. But like I said, there's been a lot of people come through the square circle gym. I mean, I can tell you tales in Blackpool Tower. You know what I mean? I tell you, it's unbelievable. I mean, the dressing rooms at the world famous Blackpool Tower. <laughs> You're changing them on elephant shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You go into a changing room where the Chinese or Russian jugglers or acrobats there, and all the chippy trays and the food trays are all there from from being there all, all for six months of the year, you know. But the wrestling business is a great, great business if it's run right and the characters in it. Oh, some of the jokes and ribs we used to play on people. Great. Hmm. But that seems What's, to have all got, gone a little bit now. What was your favourite rib that you ever seen? Oh, okay. I can't tell you yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just the road trips, you know. And I remember once blessing Dynamite Kid and myself, Davy Boy, a guy called John Foley, was always playing ribs on him, where he'd have a suit on. Um, we used to get a little razor blade and nick it all the way around the shoulder. And then we'd go in the ring and we'd start fighting and John would be there and all of a sudden we'd grab the coat and we'd pull him. I'd pull him one way and dynamites and the other guys and hearts would be pulling the other sleeve and his sleeve would come right off the suit. <laughs> and uh, I remember dynamite cut his head once or a couple of nights before and my favourite of his eating, you know, so they got me one of these big porterhouse steaks. They were beautiful. And they were well known at the restaurant and introduced me to the guy. He liked steak, so he'd give me an extra big steak. And Dynamite said, could you eat that again? Oh, I said, I don't know. I'll take it home. So he said, and just a little bit of fat around the meat that I left off. And Dynamite, like I said, had cut his head. Well, like a little nick was shaving. I don't know what it was. And he pulled a plaster off. And he just picked his head a bit and he started bleeding. And a little bit of meat that's left, he put it all over the meat. 
put the plaster back. When the guy came, Dynamite said, I've brought this fella all the way over from England, right? To have one of your first, I didn't know what the hell was going on. One of your world famous steaks. And he asked over there, if you want a steak, well done. You've got to ask for it cremated. They're well done for like our medium. You know right. what I mean? <clears throat> so he said he wanted it cremated, burnt, right? He doesn't like blood. That's why he's left. And what he'd done, he got a bit of his blood, uh, his <laughs> meat, his meat, his meat, and put it all on the table, on the same plate. That's why he's not had it. And this fellow's got, I'm sorry, Mr. John. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Off it went, because he put the blood from his head around the stage. And his blood <laughs> me. So he comes back with another 18 ounce books and I'll stay. No. Just silly little things we used to do all the time. They were happy days, though. And when you're in minus 40 degrees, you know what I mean? You can't make a snowball. It's that cold. And it's like, you know, we've all got masks on to keep warm. And the police are pulling you over and you see six masked guys in a car. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's loads of ribs. But being with Andrew the Giant was an experience. Every night you went out with him. It was good. Yeah. I've um, known him for well. No regrets. No. You ran a tag match against Hulk Hogan. What was that like? It was a bit of a mismatch thing now. What happened? Uh, they were coming, I think it was the WWF at that time, was coming over here. And in Manchester, Victoria Station is like a big arts where, you know, mm. and they had it in there. I, it was a good venue well before the uh, Manchester Arena. And there was Tony St. Clair, myself, I think it was Drew McDonald and somebody else. And they'd worked the card out. Now, you had to have, at the time, British guys on the bill. It right. was all down to that or The Americans couldn't just come in, do a show and go out. They had to have British talent right. on it. There's some law and regulation. So it cocked everything up. So we did it three aside tag match, and I was fortunate. I think it was me and Tony and Drew was against Hogan, somebody else, and somebody else. It's nothing special. It's just that he didn't have to do anything. The crowd just went potty, didn't they? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> nice guy, though. Yeah. What was the late wrestling William Regal? Because I watched one of your matches against him today, where it was his first televised match. First ever. Yeah, and there was yeah. a British Rules match, wasn't it? Yeah, and they came up with a, an idea because I was just beginning to do the championships. Put myself over like a champion, you know. And um, they didn't really want the fact that Regal and I had trained together, really. Mm -hmm. But because it was his first match and with me teaching him a few stuff, they thought we'd do an handicap match. Where I was one fall up already. Right. If you watch it again. And I end up drop kicking him. Mm. About to beat the count. And he just failed to beat the count. That's how it was. Yeah, the the, yeah, the commentator seems quite surprised by that. Like, he, like obviously, with kayfabe and that, but it seemed as if that wasn't to plan, but was that the plan? Oh, yeah. But why did he wear... Putting myself over again, so I've got the opportunity. I would like you to watch the match, and anybody else who wants to watch it, when you talk about kayfabe and things like that, how things can, for real, you've got to be able to do it as well. Because mm. mark my word, anybody who comes into the pro business, they've got to have something about them. You know what I mean? It's not as if they, you know. Mm. And it's on YouTube. And all I'm going to say to you, if you get a chance to watch it, and if you're a, an advocate of professional wrestling, when you know when somebody's trying to help somebody else mm. get a match through. Listen, I've no illusions. I was never, ever a big draw until I got a feud with somebody. Rocco, Finley, Pete Roberts, and people like that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's one thing about myself that I'm very proud of, 
a lot of the old times are still around, Colin Joints and all them, and they come to the gym, Tony St. Clair and all the young kids at the gym, and they all look up to me, which is great. And it's, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? They know I've done it and been there, but all I wanted to do was have a good match with no matter who I was on with. Mm. So if I was on with a novice, I'd work round him. And a lot of people, oh, when we give you the certificate for the Hall of Fame and all this, it's just recognition that I was a good worker. Because you get showmen, good workers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I could make the match look, get it to its potential. I could be wrestling somebody, throw somebody in for a drop kick, and I'd, I'd say, move. And as he moved, I'd take the, they didn't know it's happening, but I'd land and hurt me back. I was all finished. And I'd come mm. story, get after me back, get after me back. But there was one guy, and you'll remember this name when I tell you, right? A lad called Digger Nolan. And what happened, Max Crabtree, the promoter, was at Rickmansworth, which is down Bedworth, I think. And he says, I've got you on with this Australian kid who's over, doing a tour. I said, oh, yeah. He said, if he's any good, with you being a champion, would you mind losing? That's the first time promoter has said that to me, especially on TV. I said, why? He said, well, with Australia and England, there's always a bit of friction with the rugby especially and sport. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy was called something Billy Boggs. I don't know his name was, but the promoter called him Digger, as in Australian Nolan. And he got him one of them hats with the corks down. <laughs> right? So I get there, and a couple of lads are playing cards like they do, and I walk in. The lads have gone like this. They give me the eye. And there's this quite big dude in the corner. So I presume I'm on with him. So I goes over, shakes him by the hand, and the first thing he says, I'm winning. I said, all right. <laughs> okay. Who are you? Because by rights, I didn't know who he was, did I? Mm. I didn't know he was Digger Nolan. Just that a promoter outside told me. It's quite a big lad, but I saw the car cat on the peg, you know. <laughs> I said, I'm not being funny, who are you? He said, oh, uh, I think the promoters call me Digger Nolan. I said, all right, so we're on together and you're winning. All right, okay, fair enough. But when he went to shake hands and say hello, he looked like a piece of trash, you know. Mm -hmm. All the lads were playing cards. One of them said, wanker. <laughs> I said, who? I said, not you, him. Why? <laughs> oh, he's done this, that. Anyway, promoter comes in. I said, Marty, I'll leave it up to you, even though he told me he wants. So I said to him, from what I could tell with my experience, there's no way we could have done a lot of time. So I said, listen, can you make it one fall, the winner? Right? Plus it makes me look better if he just pips me to challenge me for the belt. I always felt if he beats me in a non-title match, you're going to see it again for the title. Anyway, the next thing is, he's just come back off a of world tour. So, where have you been? He said, well, I've just come back from Europe, which I had. He said, I've just come back from Mexico. I'd only been on two days from Mexico. So I said, what promoter do you work for in Mexico? Oh, I can't pronounce his name. So I just said, Gonzalez. Oh, that's him, yeah. There's no such promote called Gonzalez. Call this part anyway. I need her phone. <laughs> so I said to the promoter, I'll do as long as I can with him and we'll sort something out. Well, he was going to do this finish. Well, as soon as I went in the ring, I went to shake him by the hand. He slapped me that hard. He was right. Here's a struggle. But don't forget the camera's on us. And he's supposed to win. Anyway, when he's kicking, he's kicking you. And when he wanted to, he wouldn't sell anything. Now I had to throw him in the car. So the first thing is, let him know I'm here. I got him to throw him into the ropes and I tackled him. 
and I nearly knocked him out of the ring. Bang. <laughs> Everything he did was rotten. So I did as much as I can. I look up to the gods and the promoter's like this, <laughs> cut it, right? It was all right, but it wasn't. So all of a sudden, he thinks he's going to get his finish in. And now I better not tell it. I, I did a drop it. And all I'm asking you to do, or anybody who's listening to this, go on YouTube and look at the finish with Digger Nolan. Right? I whispered in his ear, run. And as I throw him back, and I went, like fuck. In other words, run like <laughs> hell. And he ran, I dropped down, he went over the top, and I hit him. My size 13, right on the nose. And he did a 360. Referee counted him out. He carried him out. He got his stuff in his bag. Right? And left without getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> got a taxi and went home. Of course. <laughs> but there's loads of phonies. They've said they've done this, they've done that, they've done that. And you can suss out. You know, there's a lot of guys in our business that make other guys look really well, put them over, the good workers. Mm. Nowadays, you've, they've got script writers to do all that, which I don't... You know, but you can't take anything from the, the good workers. And the opportunity now for a good, for a young kid coming in the business, male or female, there's a big reward for it if you do it right. Mm. Be respectful. Don't be big headed. Have no ego, but train. And like I say, I didn't have the best body. I've never lifted a weight in my life, but I, I could back anybody for stamina. Mm. Keep on going. I think the amateurs did that for me as well when you kept <clears> resting <throat> on the mat because amateur wrestling is like the, the ultimate sports fitness. You know, all your MMA fighters are all the top 12 are all Olympic wrestlers. You know, yeah, it's, it's a good basis to have then, isn't it? Oh, that yeah. Kind of... yeah. Well, down to you guys as well. You know, yeah, I don't know who's going to listen to this and they think it's probably a lot of bullshit. And this, <laughs> I've never met you before <laughs> in my life, so you just talk about it. But when you've done it yourself, yeah, you know, and pass the stories on. It might, I get all this sometimes. Oh, British wrestling's boring. British podcasts are boring. Well, my answer to that is, don't listen to it. Turn <laughs> <laughs> it off. I mean, why yeah. do you do these podcasts? We started just, <laughs> just just to talk about wrestling. If I met listen to it, that's fine. But we just wanted to talk about wrestling, essentially. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. keep telling me, why don't you go on this subscribe channel and earn some money out of it? The answer is, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Old fashioned. Yeah. You know, but it's just the way it is. I would have liked, and I still want to do, five more matches to be honest I would love to nobody seems to retire anymore mm. you know they retire the next week they're, they're wrestling again somewhere yeah but well, I would like to have say done a Blackpool an Oldham a Hanley yeah. just five five matches you know and and like I say I I have no illusions 90% of people don't know who I am but in the wrestling world, with social media these days, I, I'm the, like the British and European Commissioner now at wrestling. So I go to some shows and say, this is an official championship match. He gets a bit of eating, he gets some round, you know. Mm, yeah. I do my wrestling seminars. I go to WrestleSlam in, in, um, in, in Finland. I go to SIW, places like that in Italy. And hey, don't get me wrong, I like going over there and having the weekend. Because it's 18 Ireland, I love going over there having the crack. Mm. But passing a bit of knowledge on as well. Yeah. I think we should try and get, when NXT comes to Blackpool again, yeah. try and get William Regal against Matty Jones, the rematch. <laughs> a rematch? <laughs> I don't think it's a rematch, I won. <laughs> <laughs> But to be fair, nobody knew me who I was until Regal, in, in his his speech, like, uh, he said, there's a guy over there who I want to thank, Marty Jones. Then the wrestling punters know who you are because they relate to the television. Mm. Mm. 
But with social media these days, I can see all the young kids going like this on the phone. Who the hell is it? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just the way forward. I think some of your uh, matches on like YouTube have got some quite high views. So people have yeah. there are people watching your old matches from World of Sports well, Days. Somebody accused me the other day of what well, not the word vain in their ways. It's big headed, mm. and all it was there was a match on the other day, and. I feel sorry for the guys that give the time and who used to travel with and wrestle. And I know he's not so clever at the moment. Johnny South. Not Johnny South, Johnny South. And somebody sent me a match with Johnny South. So I went, yeah, John, meaning watch it might cheer you up a little bit. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, I'm a big-headed bastard for putting me all matches on. <laughs> I'm Man. thinking... You knew what it was. Why did you watch it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're gonna have to end the podcast there because I mean I could talk. We could talk to you. Yeah, all me night. too. We want to start the service. But we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. If if you ever come to Blackpool, I I would absolutely love to meet you. I mean, you are you have shaped British wrestling. Bring dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bring my dad. <laughs> You're like a fan girl. Yeah. <laughs> no, next time the wrestling is there, I, I'll be there for sure. You know what I mean? Because I get to see Regal when we have a chat, and I see mm. all the guys and girls that's gone through the gym, and it's yeah. lovely for them to turn around and say thanks, mate. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's if... good. Well, listen, I want to thank you two for being professional as well. It's the first. I knew. I think I saw the one that you did with Sam. You know, your approach is good. Mm. Uh, and keep on doing it because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that are doing it. And then they'll say, if you want to look at Marty Jones' uh, podcast, sign up today, it'll be five quid or a tenner or whatever and all this lot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like people are saying to me, I I've seen it on there. I'll, I'll cut you short now. He's got, do you want to buy some DVDs of Marty Jones? I went, hang on a minute. The best of Marty Jones DVDs, the best of Johnny Saint, best of this, best of that. And all the are of punters that have taken them off the TV were the sport matches, the quality. Oh, God. <laughs> do it. Well, then. Um... Anyway, lovely meeting you both. And anytime I can jump in with anybody or whatever. And if you ever want to, the pair of you, an exclusive scoop for you, once a square circle, and it's only. In Oldham, off the end, it's an hour exactly yeah. from Blackpool. Yeah. Come on down, bring your gear if you want, and you can. I, I've got the old world of sport guys there. Yes. You've got the up and coming future stars there, and you, we've got a room where you can take them. You can watch it, and you can film it. You can do what ask them questions. Yeah, I'm yeah, not for that. Yeah. We might even have you two taking a bump. <laughs> we'll we'll put all your um, squared circle gym details on our social media as well for anyone in oh, to check out yeah yeah when we're up and running everything's hunky dory yeah mm -hmm. I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us it's been an thing, absolute... there's only one bad thing Kieran go on you're going to say that I'm reading the scarf now and he's going to say that <laughs> <laughs> alright yeah take care uh, mate and you John thank, thank you. you thank you thank you give us some feedback